Our remaining chapters in Unit 2 focus on energy and how cells transform and use that energy. Chapter 6 specifically focuses on the kinds of reactions that happen in our cells, our energy storing molecule ATP, and enzymes, which are molecules that regulate chemical reactions. So our learning objectives center around how cells use, transfer, and manage energy during chemical reactions. In other words, how cells perform the process of, processes of metabolism. So we'll discuss a little bit about thermodynamics and the types of reactions that occur inside cells. Um, again, as I said a minute ago, we will talk about our energy-containing molecule, ATP, and start discussing how that molecule actually works as energy currency, how it transfers its energy, and how its energy is used. We'll also talk in depth about our proteins called enzymes that work to regulate chemical reactions. So we will look at how they function and the environmental factors that affect those enzymes. So in Unit 2, Chapters 6, 7, and 8, we talk a lot about energy and how cells use and produce energy. So a living cell can basically be thought of as a mini miniature chemical factory. And in this chemical factory, there are thousands of reactions that are occurring all the time to help that cell run, to help it do its job, to help it grow, to help it interact with its environment. And as part of all of these chemical reactions, cells extract energy from sugars and other molecules that they bring in in order to produce energy. So in chapter seven, we'll actually learn about the process of cellular respiration, where cells release the energy from carbohydrates in order to produce ATP, that is a usable form of chemical energy in the cell. So that's why we introduce ATP in chapter six. In chapter eight, we're gonna learn about photosynthesis and how plants harness the sun's energy in the form of carbohydrate bonds. Now, all of these processes, um, all of our metabolic processes, cellular respiration, photosynthesis, they are all controlled chemical reactions in our cell. And so we spend a lot of time in chapter six talking about the types of chemical reactions that re occur in those cells. So let's start talking about metabolism. An organism's metabolism transforms matter and energy. So when you think of metabolism, you probably think about the things that you eat and the calories that, you're bur that you burn. Well, the same thing is happening at the molecular level. In fact, the things that you bring into your body and the energy that you burn are being brought into cells, broken down or transformed in at the cellular level through the process of metabolism. So that same metabolism that you think about when you eat food is actually occurring at the cellular level. So metabolism is all the chemical reactions that occur in an organism. And each of those metabolic reactions is part of a larger metabolic pathway. So a metabolic pathway is simply a series of steps that modifies or adjusts, transforms a particular molecule in a cell. So in a metabolic pathway, a specific molecule is altered in a series of steps to make a specific product. Now that product's not just going to sit around and accumulate in the cell, it's going to be used immediately as part of another metabolic pathway. Now all of these reactions are controlled by enzymes. 
So if you remember from chapter three, we talked about the functions of proteins. There were eight different functions. And one of the main functions of a protein was to act as an enzyme. An enzyme is a biological catalyst. So a catalyst is a chemical that helps a chemical reaction occur without being consumed. And those enzymes are gonna control the progression of metabolic pathways. So they are going to regulate the rate. They're gonna regulate when a reaction starts or when a reaction stops. And they're gonna regulate all steps in between. So biological systems are never in equilibrium because products don't accumulate, because they are constantly being used. Over here on the right-hand side, we have a complicated diagram, really a simplified diagram, but it shows a uh, sort of cartoon view of all of the metabolic steps that are happening in a cell. And you might notice that almost all of them feed directly or indirectly to this series of steps down the middle. Now that series of steps down the middle is cellular respiration. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. We're gonna get to that in chapter seven. And at the end here, we have this loop. This is the Krebs cycle. So if you've taken biology before, you might be familiar with the Krebs cycle. That is one of the steps in respiration. And in the Krebs cycle, that's where we produce our ATP. And every single one of these little dots is a product that's part of a metabolic pathway that is ultimately geared toward cellular respiration. So enzymes control the progression of metabolic pathways. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So a catalyst and therefore an enzyme is a molecule that controls the rate of a reaction without being consumed. In other words, it can be used over and over again because it's not actually part of the reaction. It's regulating the reaction. So let's say that we have reactant A and we want to convert it into reactant B. Well, through the course of reaction one, we need an enzyme that acts on reactant A to convert it into B. And then let's say we continue this pathway and we now need to convert B into C. So the second step in our pathway is to use enzyme B that acts on reactant B in order to get to C and so on and so forth. And now maybe D is used up. And so now we have to start over again with our process. And then enzyme A comes back in and works on reactant A. Enzyme B comes in and works on reactant B. This is just a quick example of how these metabolic pathways work. There are two types of metabolic pathways, catabolic and anabolic. In a catabolic pathway, we are going to break down a material or a molecule and we release energy. So this is what's happening in cellular respiration where we break down glucose to release ATP. Now on the right hand side over here, we have a little diagram of that. So we have a simple molecule here and it is being broken down into its individual components. And because chemical bonds 
contain energy. When you break a chemical bond, you release that energy. Now, that energy, energy can be um, a specific form, such as ATP, that can be used in the cell, or it might be heat that is lost to its surroundings. I remember that catabolic pathways are um, the ones that break things by thinking about cats and the fact that sometimes our cats are jerks and they break things. They knock them off the counter, they tip things over. That's how I remember catabolic pathways break molecules. The opposite, anabolic pathways, use energy to build more complicated molecules. In other words, there is an input of energy. So energy is stored. And you've probably already guessed that energy is stored in the chemical bonds between the molecules. I don't have a good way to remember an anabolic pathway. Um, if you're familiar with anabolic steroids, they help you build up muscle. If you're unfamiliar with that, that's probably not going to help you. If anybody has any little tricks to remember anabolic pathways, I am more than happy to listen to them and I will share them with the class. So let's talk about the different forms of energy. Um, energy is the capacity to cause change and it can exist in various forms. Some of those forms can perform work. So we are going to focus on chemical energy, but there are different types of energy that we can, that we could study. We have kinetic energy, the energy of motion. We have thermal energy, we have heat energy. We have light energy, and we have potential energy. I apologize for the color on my pen. I can't see the uh, menu because of the way that the recording screen is set up, so I can't change my pen color. Um, all of these energies are, or types of energies are really important in including in living organisms. Um, we are not going to focus on them. We are gonna focus on chemical energy, which is the energy stored in chemical bonds. Now, energy can be converted from one form to another. And so we are gonna use that in our cells as we do these metabolic pathways. So let's talk a little bit about how we study energy. So thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations. So energy and matter can be transferred between an organism and its surroundings. Energy can also be transferred within an organism. So if we're transferring uh, between, let's say between two organisms or within an organism, we're transferring energy and we're also potentially transforming it. If energy is being released into the surroundings, it's usually being lost to the system. So energy does not accumulate It might be stored for a short time, but then it needs to be transferred. 
I'm sorry, I forgot. Energy does not accumulate, but can be transferred. It can also be lost. So every time that we have a chemical transfer, a little bit of energy is lost. And it is lost from the system and released. So the first law of thermodynamics helps to describe more specifically how energy actually behaves. According to the first law of thermodynamics, the energy of the universe is constant. This means that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred or transformed. This is also called the principle of conservation of energy. So what does this actually mean for living organisms? Well, what this means is that Organisms can obtain energy from their environment. They can transform that energy, so they take it in and they can store it for a short time in energy storage molecules such as carbohydrates or fats, in which case they, are, they can then transfer that energy in order to transform it back into a usable form for the cell, or they can transfer that energy to other organisms. For example, here we have this bear eating a fish. It's probably a salmon. So that energy from the salmon is being transferred to the bear. Now organisms also release energy. And that leads us to the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics says that every energy transfer or transformation increases the disorder of the universe. Now the word here that's actually used in the second law of thermodynamics is entropy. Instead of disorder, they say entropy. Now, entropy and disorder refers to essentially unused or available energy in the environment. So this is energy that has been released and is not in a usable form. In most cases, it is released as heat and is essentially lost in space. It is no longer available for other organisms to use or for other chemical reactions. So what does this mean for living organisms? If every transfer or transformation of energy increases entropy, this means that organisms lose energy, sorry, lose energy from the system. So some energy was bound up in that salmon. It was transferred to the bear where it was stored as fats, most likely. And then when that bear was ready to use that energy, it was transformed into kinetic energy or energy of motion. With that transformation from chemical energy to kinetic energy, the bear releases heat because all chemical reactions release energy. And in a living cell, 
we release that energy as heat. Heat energy is not usable by the organism, and that is what is increasing in the system. Now, I don't want you to assume that the system is heating up because what I'm saying is that energy, free energy that is no longer available to the system is increasing. So let's talk about what that has to do with reactions within a cell. So there are two types of reaction processes in a cell. We already talked about anabolic and catabolic, but let's talk about the way that those reactions start, whether they are anabolic or catabolic. So there are two processes that help us to uh, sort of speed our reactions along or make our reactions go. One is a spontaneous process. Now, if you think about what the word spontaneous means, you're probably thinking like, it just happens. You did it all of a sudden. So spontaneous processes occur without energy input. In other words, it might appear that they just started on their own. Now, they can happen quickly or slowly. And one misconception that students have is that something that's spontaneous must be fast. If you're talking about a chemical reaction, spontaneity has nothing to do with speed. It has to do with the reaction getting started. So a reaction like rusting is actually a spontaneous process, but it's a very slow process. We often don't even notice that it's happening. But what spontaneous means is that there is energy, there is no energy required to make the reaction go. For a process to be spontaneous, it must increase the entropy of the universe. But what that means for living cells is that energy is released. Now, if we have a process that occurs without energy input, you might think, well, we probably have a process that requires energy in, and we do. In a non-spontaneous uh, process, energy must be supplied for the reaction to progress. Processes that are non-spontaneous are going to decrease in entropy. What this means, excuse me, <laughs> I was about to write exactly the same thing. It basically just means that energy must be supplied. So energy is required to come into the reaction. So in a spontaneous process, there's no energy input, but there is an energy output. In a non-spontaneous process, there is an, only an energy input. So energy is consumed in the reaction. So we've already talked about a spontaneous process. When we were in chapter five and learning about diffusion, we saw a spontaneous process. And there's an example here that shows the spontaneous process. So we have this apparatus here where all of our gas molecules are on one side. If you open up the valve in between, those molecules that are in high concentration are going to move across to where they are in low concentration until they are in equilibrium. Now that happens because these molecules have thermal energy and they move around and they bump into each other. And there's really nothing you can do to stop it. But if you put energy into the system, if you do some work to cause those molecules to go back, you are inputting energy. In other words, in this non-spontaneous process, you can actually go the other way and take our molecules that were spread out 
and accumulate them on one side. So I want to go over a couple of terms that our book uses because um, you'll see these examples. I might say it in class. Um, during a spontaneous reaction, we say that delta G is negative. Now delta G is just a measure of free energy. So in a spontaneous reaction, we said that delta G was negative and that energy is released. So we say that it is negative because it is lost from the reactants. And when it is lost from the reactants, it is released. This causes our reactants to produce stable products. So another way to think of this is that in a spontaneous reaction, your products are, sorry, your reactants are high energy and unstable. And by reacting, they release that energy and become stable. So there's a picture of that here. In an exergonic reaction, which is also a spontaneous reaction, we release energy. So this graph here shows the amount of energy in our reactants. That amount of energy is high. So these reactants have high energy. That also means they are unstable. Now, because they have high energy and are unstable, they're going to react or want to react very quickly. When they react, they release some energy, and now the products are lower energy and more stable. Because that process released energy and because there was no energy required to start that reaction there was no energy input because the reactants already were high energy that reaction was spontaneous now exergonic reactions are also going to be catabolic reactions because remember that catabolic reactions release energy so we have several things happening in conjunction we have exergonic reactions that are spontaneous and catabolic releasing energy. During a non-spontaneous reaction, our delta G is positive. And what this means is that energy is gained by the system, which is why we call it positive. So we have to put energy into our reaction which means that our products are now high energy and therefore less stable. So in an endergonic reaction, we require an input of energy. And endergonic reactions store energy because we're putting energy in. They are anabolic reactions. Remember, we have to put energy in to build molecules, and they are non-spontaneous. Remember that non-spontaneous requires an energy input. So down here on the bottom, we have reactants with relatively low energy. We put some energy in, which makes them non-spontaneous. When we form chemical bonds, when we add energy to the system, we are forming chemical bonds, we are building anabolic, we are building our products. So our endergonic reactions are building reactions that require energy. Now there is a special relationship between endergonic and exergonic reactions. Remember that exergonic reactions release energy. And remember that endergonic reactions require energy. So the energy that is released from an exergonic reaction can be coupled or paired with an endergonic reaction, which means that energy released from the breakdown 
of one molecule can be used to power the building of another. Now, if you're confused by all these terms, it will make a huge difference if you sit down and you make some flashcards. And you also, when you're making those flashcards, write out the relationship between these terms. Exergonic reactions are also spontaneous and catabolic. Endergonic reactions are non-spontaneous and anabolic. 